Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1990 film Frankenhooker by Frank Henenlotter. Yes, written and directed by Frank Henenlotter. And when I'm done with this, this completes my reviews of Frank Henenlotter films. I have a playlist on my channel if you want to see the other ones. All three of the Basket Case films, Brain Damage, uh, Bad Biology, and now Frankenhooker. Now, one of the things that occurred to me after I completed watching Frankenhooker and I was doing my notes for this was that it, it really dawned on me this is kind of like an epiphany that I had the movie Basket Case by Hen and Lauder created two trilogies basically now both those trilogies being obviously the Basket Case trilogies of Basket Case 1, 2, and 3 but then also Basket Case, Brain Damage, and Frankenhooker which are the New York trilogy and it's just mainly because they're set in the same city and they're focused on kind of these the seedy looking city now um i don't have any you know information from frank hen and lauder saying that uh the um the three films that are not bass case you know bass case brain damage and frankenhooker are an, an actual trilogy but i think it's actually been referred to as like the new york trilogy or something like that the other thing that i realized is that all five of the movies are in the same universe basically or at least could be in the same universe. We know, after watching Brain Damage, that Basket Case and Brain Damage are certainly in the same universe, so that covers the first three, the three Basket Case movies and Brain Damage, and then I would assume, if that's the case, why wouldn't Frankenhooker also be? Because the other thing being, in Basket Case, Brain Damage, and Frankenhooker, they all go to a motel that looks very similar, and I think that's supposed to be the same motel in the same place, kind of tying everything together. So that's just the thought up front. Now let's talk more about Frankenhooker specifically. Obviously, uh, written and directed by Frank Henenlotter. Like I said, he's done Brain Damage, Basket Case, all three of those films, Bad Biology, and then documentaries Herschel Gordon Lewis, The Godfather of Gore, Chasing Banksy, and Boiled Angels, The Trial of Mike Diana. Uh, do, 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 do. Robert Martin was also a writer on Frankenhooker. Now, he was also a writer in the script for Basket Case 3, The Progeny. That's the only other thing that he worked uh, with Hen and Lauder on. James Lawrence um, is Jeffrey in this, and I loved him as Jeffrey in this. His Jersey accent is so thick and so funny, and his acting is great in this. I love his acting. It's, it's bad. It's not like bad, but it's like fun, and it's funny. So I think that kind of mix kind of carries a lot of the film because if you think about the actual script of it, the actual story of it, this is disturbing stuff. If you just read the script, you'd be like, this is really messed up and this is really disturbing. But it's presented in a way that's actually light and funny and fun, which is weird. And that's that has a lot to do with the acting and how that's done, the way it's filmed, which is a typical Hen and Lauder thing. He makes things kind of cartoonish and happy and upbeat and then the music is another thing the music is very light and happy and upbeat so it keeps something that would otherwise be very disgusting and disturbing and makes it just fun and funny so that's hen and lauder in a nutshell so james lawrence who plays jeffrey uh had bit parts in street trash which i still need to do a review for robocop 3 the irishman yes the irishman on netflix and he was also in the jerky boys movie so I just thought that was interesting. Now, Patty Mullen, who played Elizabeth, a.k.a. Frankenhooker in this, did nothing after this film. Like, this was kind of it. I don't know if it was a situation where she just didn't want to do acting anymore or this kind of ended that for her. I don't know because of the role. Who knows? So the cost for this film apparently was $1.5 million, and it ended up making just a bit over 205000 So big loss on profits there. Uh, no profits, really, just a loss. But, you know, it's a cult classic now, so I'm sure Hen and Lauder doesn't, uh, doesn't regret making the film, rightfully so. So in order to save money, Hen and Lauder called in a favor from a guy who was a friend of his who had done pyrotechnics before because a lot of the $1.5 million was going to be taken up by the pyrotechnics. So he figured, how do we cut this down? How do we get it cheaper and allocate that money elsewhere? So he got a favor from someone to do the pyrotechnics in this. Now, this is a quote, reportedly, uh, from the guy when he set up the pyrotechnics. Don't worry, it's maybe safe. 
I would not recommend going this route. I understand this was a different time. This was the 80s and everything. Um, safety is important. I would not recommend going this route, but it adds to the story of this film being made. Release ended up getting delayed due to the fact that they were having a difficulty getting an R rating. Now, this is also a, this is said, and by Hen and Lauder, this is said, what happened with the MPAA is that they called and left a message with, I think, the secretary of the production company and said, congratulations, you're the first film rated S. S for shit. Um, <laughs> which, if that is the case, that's unbelievably unprofessional uh, by the MPAA, but also... It's a story. It might not be true. I don't know. But I thought that was worth throwing out there. Now, um, Frankenhooker, Elizabeth, when she's Frankensteined up, has purple nipples. Now, initially, they were supposed to also pan down and show purple pubic hair. Now, they had problems with the dyeing of hair, so uh, they ended up kind of cutting that out. So I thought that was interesting. And then this is very interesting. I didn't know this, and this is insane to me, kind of. Bill Murray liked this film, and he publicly had kind of endorsed Frankenhooker. Bill Murray, man. You should watch it, because Bill Murray. That's crazy. Um, all right, so here we go. Sorry for the pause there. I'm just trying to figure out. This film is crazy, by the way. It, it it's The best way that I put it to people is it's absurd, but it's a lot of fun. Now, you gotta love how Hen and Lauder likes just jumping right into things like weird things, and that's easily seen in this film with the start of it, where it's Jeffrey sitting in, I believe it's a kitchen at the table, and he's doing things with this brain with an eyeball in a purple liquid. And as we see throughout the film, purple is a reoccurring color, and that's kind of like this rejuvenating slash um, uh, liquid. It's like a rejuvenating liquid, but also it kind of just like keeps cells alive, I guess, is how that's supposed to be, because that's where he puts all the body parts, is in a, you know, meat freezer filled with this stuff. Um, but it's typical head and lotter to start with something really crazy and then just keep going from there, which it obviously does. So Elizabeth saying that Jeff Jeffrey being a doctor as a hobby, uh, like it's kind of like a normal thing, is really wacky. The fact that she was talking to the friend and saying... Oh yeah, and he stapled my stomach for me because she was concerned about gaining weight. Um, and they're just like, oh, he could do that? I didn't know he was a doctor. He's, oh, well, you know, he's a doctor, he's a hobby. He actually works for the electric company, I guess. It's just such a weird thing to just like kind of offhandedly dismiss as normal. Uh, but, you know, that's hen a lot of films for you. Elizabeth being so dumb that she runs herself over with the remote-controlled lawnmower is kind of ridiculous and over the top. But then again, you know, there's a lot of idiocy with characters within this film. You have to assume that everyone is stupid in Hen and Lauder films for the most part. And if you do, you can just go on with the film. You pretty much know what to ex expect because of the title. That's another thing. Franken-Hooker. I mean, it obviously is a play on the old Frankenstein story, very obviously, that's very, very, very obvious. And um, you kind of know that there's going to be a hooker aspect. Now, you might not necessarily know that he's going to blow up hookers with super crack and then use their body parts to resurrect his girlfriend, but hey, you see it coming as things are playing out. Uh, the way the news, this this is a small thing that I noticed watching this time around. The way that new, the news in this movie covered Elizabeth's lawnmower accident was really weird. Like, they had a lot of puns in it, and it was like they were making fun of the whole situation. Now, I don't know if that was a little bit of Hen and Lauder kind of poking fun at the way media covers things, and kind of like salacious things like that are, are what they lead with as kind of entertainment for people. I think maybe that that was kind of the point he was trying to make, but it was, it was just weird the way they covered it. But funny, you know, it adds. Uh, I love the cartoonish design of the Garage Lab. The Garage Lab, that reveal, the first reveal of it, is a lot of fun for me. And this is what I'm talking about with, you know, Hen and Lauder doing things in a cartoonish way to keep it, like, light and fluffy to a degree. You know... So if if a lot of the stuff was like normal sized in the lab, it would just look kind of more normal real life lab type thing. But the fact that he he has like these coils and he even takes in this like massive spark plug, like he just makes everything big so it's just like over the top. It, like I'm saying, it's cartoonish, 
and that kind of adds to this really you know fun light concept so based on the concept art that Jeffrey shows Elizabeth uh, that Jeffrey shows Elizabeth's head um, it's obvious that his reconstruction of her is really driven by hormones and I'm talking about when he's having the dinner with her and he's showing her the pictures of these kind of mock-up concepts of what her new body will look like and it's all like women from porno mags with her head on them so it's obvious that it's very sexually driven it's not necessarily that he misses her it's that he misses her body like everything is very obviously it's super the male's gaze in this but it's super hyper sexualized from the prostitution to the way that jeffrey approaches and thinks about elizabeth you know it, it's all sexual and it seems that he kind of looks at her you know the ability to build her body as a way to reconstruct her the way he wants her and not the way that she actually was now to a degree i think she liked it at first when she was resurrected because she was much skinnier until she starts to realize these are not my body parts and things don't necessarily match and then it just doesn't feel right obviously uh so I think that partially it gets to the point of the amount of control that sometimes men like to have with women in relationships and not just romantic re relationships, but all types of relationships. Obviously you see Zorro in this having control over many women in the prostitution relationship that he has with them, which by the way, I love the character of Zorro. He's just ridiculous. It's just another one of those characters. It's just like, he's so dumb but it enhances the film because of how dumb he is. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, Jeffrey's behavior with the body parts don't seem so crazy since he had his monologue about becoming detached from reality. Yeah, if they just went into it where he's just like doing things with all these body parts and not acting like it's a, th a, a thing, um, you would just be like, what the heck is going on here? But the fact that he has his little monologue earlier saying that ever since the accident with Elizabeth, He's been feeling like he's growing more and more detached from reality. You keep that in your mind and you see that like, oh yes, this is him kind of spiraling, spiraling out of control. And that doesn't really stop. Uh, there are moments here and there where he kind of breaks from it a little bit, but then he gets out his little drill and zzz, drills into his own head, which by the way, that is insane to me. I kind of feel like that's kind of geared as his version of drugs. Because Hennen Lauder in a lot of his films touches on like drug usage and drug abuse. You know, brain damage he does quite a bit. Um, there's a degree of it, in, I think, in Bad Biology and Basket Case, at least in the first one, just being in like the CD New York and showing things like that. It's It kind of gets to a little bit of that too. But um, yeah, I kind of view it as, you know, Jeffrey drilling into his own head is his way of getting this euphoric feeling, getting his head straight in a way and feeling better because it starts to wear off at certain times and he has to redo it so it's kind of like he gets a high out of it now the fact that he can shove a drill in his head and not scream for pain doesn't make sense obviously but then again not a lot about this film really does make sense so once again it's cartoonish it's like cartoon violence you know like the roadrunner um hitting the coyote with an anvil like there, there isn't any pain shown or anything like that. You just accept it as, oh, that just happens and he can walk it off. It's very much what, what Hen and Lauder does with his films. Uh, Jeffrey scoping out the prostitutes for body parts is funny, but this is another one of those moments that if the music wasn't the right way and the film hadn't been set up in such a light, funny, fun way, it would be really disturbing and really, really creepy. Uh, but because they set it up the way that they, well, because Hennenlotter set it up the way that he did, it's just kind of funny and fun. Uh, so yeah. The Jersey accent Jeffrey has is excellent. I already talked about that. Uh, Zorro's place. When Jeffrey first goes into Zorro's place, that place is out of control. It is so over the top. But once again, that's what Hennenlotter does. Over-sexualization. Overboard with all these people there doing drugs and just being crazy. I mean, the fact that everyone's hanging out in the bathroom at Zorro's place is is nuts. I mean, you would think these people kind of want to, like, spread out because there's a lot of space in there. Um, hanging out in the bathroom doesn't make sense, especially for Zorro if it's his place. I would be in a much more comfortable place if I was him. It's just weird. The head drilling ends up being like a drug. I already talked about that. Sorry. Jeffrey, te chest yeah. Jeffrey testing the super crack on his guinea pig. I think is my favorite scene of the film 
not because of him testing on the guinea pig, but because of the way he's talking to the guinea pig when he's like putting the fumes to him is he's talking like he's going to be talking to the prostitutes. Like how much money do you want? Like all those types of things. It's really, it's really funny the way that scene plays out. And a lot of that has to do with the acting of Lawrence. Um, Jeffrey, the character really good in this. I think the, mo oh, I already talked about that one. Jeffrey tries to keep the ladies from using the super crack, probably, because there is that one little moment where he, he does try and keep them from using the super crack because he's rethinking his idea of blowing them up and taking the parts. Um, but he does try to stop them, and I think for a moment that happens because his drill effects had worn off at that point. If you remember, when he would do the drill effects, it would kind of make him more bold, it would focus him more on this crazy idea to reconstruct Elizabeth, so... I think that's why he kind of has that moment where he's trying to stop them from doing it, but obviously they do it. And the body explosions that ensue are super fun, but I would argue that you should have a lot of blood in this scene. When all the body parts are blowing up, there's absolutely no blood. I think you should have blood flying everywhere. I think that's the one thing that Hen and Lotter really missed with this film. Hen and Lotter apparently signed and gave away those those uh, extra boob pieces uh, where he has that kind of like pile of fake breasts when he's trying to, to cobble together uh, Elizabeth. Uh, apparently, I had read that he had uh, taken those and signed a bunch of them and gave them to cast and crew when they were done filming as kind of like little mementos. I just thought that was a funny little thing to tell. The typical Frankenstein's monster creation scene is present in this, with along with the theme of the creation not turning out as intended. That always happens with these Frankenstein-type stories. Now, obviously, in this situation, it doesn't turn out like intended because the prostitute body parts kind of overtake um, Elizabeth's brain, and then that's why, and I don't know if people notice this, when she's first resurrected, the only things she can say are things that prostitutes have already said within the film. So I think it, you know, most people just view it as, oh, it's just funny she's saying all these things that prostitutes say. But notice that everything she said has already been said by a prostitute in the film. And I thought that was interesting to kind of have that level of detail and stick to it. Uh, Elizabeth only, or I, I literally just said that. I'm sorry, you guys. I'm a little messed up on my focus today. I guess Elizabeth is like a battery holding all the electricity from that storm because, you know, when she has sex with the guy and it's smoking and then he explodes and he, she's holding his head and, you know, she's giving off electricity, which the only way I can explain it is she's holding it in until she does sexual things and then it releases it and has very bad effects on people around it. Spike telling Elizabeth to slow up on the pretzels when she go when, as the Frankenhooker, goes to Zorro's, elicits anger because prior to the lawnmower accident, the real Elizabeth was talking about being concerned with her weight. So that is a little bit of, of a moment where I think the actual Elizabeth shows or comes through because she's eating those pretzels and then Spike is like, slow down, uh, something to something alluding to she'll gain weight. So just a, just my thought on it. The crazy street preacher in this, real quick, he shows up a few times towards the end of this. That is Lyle from Basket Case 2. I love that dude's acting. He did such a great job in Basket Case 2. Uh, he's one of my favorite parts of that, of that film. You can check that review out on my channel. Zorro was making the women sell their parts, obviously, as the pimp. So it's only fitting that he's attacked by those parts he was selling at the end of the film. Oh, the irony. So I like how the film ends that way, not just because it's, you know, Zorro getting his at the end and it's ironic, but also because it's Hen and Lauder taking some things and making really weird looking things, kind of like a Belial type character from the Basket Case films. So all for it. Uh, some final thoughts on this film. Jeffrey gets a taste of his own medicine in the end, obviously, and deservedly so. Because after Zorro got his, Jeffrey gets his. Because Jeffrey, when he was creating Elizabeth, his new version of Elizabeth, he was so focused on making her, like, super hot and sexy and, you know, the perfect physical body for him that it's just so funny when he gets his at the end. And, you know, Elizabeth gave him basically the body that he was looking for with her. 
And so he can just stand there and look at himself in the mirror and, and enjoy himself that way. I like that ending to it. So like Basket Case and Brain Damage, this film revels in the seedy underbelly of New York. Uh, that's one of the things I really like about the films is that they just are so dark and seedy and scummy, you know, and it, it's just an interesting setting for things. And it's the same thing with like the film Maniac. Same thing. I really dig it. So those are all my thoughts on Frankenhooker. It is a fun film. And obviously this is one of those films that I have to review two different ways. I have, so as a film in general out of five stars with half stars in play, um, I mean, I'm going to give it uh, two and a half stars, I guess, as, as just a straight up film. Um, cause there are problems and it's not like the most serious and plot holes and all that stuff, but at the, at the same time, it's fun and a lot of stuff well executed. Now, as far as so bad, it's good films out of five stars with half stars in play. Um, I give it three and a half. I'm gonna give it a three and a half. It's not my favorite of the Hen and Lauders. I think maybe brain damage is at, at this moment. I don't remember what I what I gave that on my review because it's been a while. It's been over a year, I think, since I did brain damage. Or it may be about a year. It feels like it's been a long time. But anyway. But yes, um, let's talk in the comments about uh brain or about Frank and Hooker. Actually, we can talk about all Hen and Lauder in the comments, but specifically Frank and Hooker for this one, but go crazy if you want to. Um do me a quick favor though, hit that subscribe button if you like this review video or any videos I have ever done because that is the best way to repay me and I 100% appreciate it when people do that for me. It gives me a very big sense of gratitude and I see all of you people who are subscribing. I literally get an email and it tells me who it is that has sub subscribed and I look at you guys. I, I, fit, I actually look at the picture you have and feel grateful for you subscribing. So I appreciate that. Um, also, if you are going to subscribe, make sure you hit the notification bell, and that way you know anytime that uh, I'm putting up a new video, whether it's a movie review, an unboxing, or doing a live stream. But regardless, thanks for checking this out, and until next time, keep it brutal.